if we being honest about our trouble, we don't need God to just meet us in the sanctuary. Some of us are praying, God, I need you to meet me at my bedside. Because late at night, when the phone isn't ringing and the text messages have stopped, the devil does a good job playing with our mind. And some of us, he has, he has us running so many fear scenarios. What if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this doesn't go well? And what if that doesn't go right? And we're losing sleep and we're losing peace. And where we need God to meet us. Psalm 27, verse 5 and verse 6. Psalm 27, verse 5 and verse 6. Have you found it? Is there a word there? To God be the glory. He always has a word for our life. This is what it says. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me his pavilion. Oh, I can't wait to get there. In the secret of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me up on, upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I, I feel like I need to read that one more time. That, that, that was good to my soul. Uh, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Uh, today I want to speak using this subject and thought in our minds. I have trouble, but trouble don't have me. I have trouble, but trouble doesn't have me. I have trouble, but trouble doesn't have me. When I was growing up, I was introduced to a board game by the name of Trouble. I don't know if you have ever played it before. It's been a while since I've, since I've played it. It had a little thing in the middle where you press the dice and it pops back up again, and based on that, you can move around, and yeah, it was a little bit of trouble, but I mean, it was just a game. When I was a child, trouble was just an anecdotic thing. It was just conceptual what trouble is. Trouble was like, ooh, you won't get in trouble. You just put a hole in mom and dad's wall. <laughs> Y'all never been there. Yeah, I put some holes in the wall. Uh, you know, being, being a kid. Trouble was, ooh, this thing happened. Ooh, that thing happened. And that was my concept of trouble. But trouble's become a much different thing at 44 than it was at 8, 10, 12. Matter of fact, if I be honest with you, when I started when I started in ministry at 15 years old, my concept of trouble then is not my concept of trouble now. And I know you're like, not you, Reverend. Surely, because you are a preacher, you don't have to deal with anything. But let me tell y'all something. I have seen and felt trouble in ways that I could not have imagined. I've learned trouble in a very real, very personal, very foundational, shaking kind of way. Where you, you leave, you're left thinking to yourself, how in the world did this happen? Lord, are you, are you serious? Asking that question, God, is there anything I can do to change it? Already no, and the answer is no. I mean, that trouble when you don't have time to call anybody trouble. I'm talking about that trouble when even if you could call somebody, it's nothing they can do kind of trouble. Y'all not walk with me today. I'm 
I'm talking about I've been in trouble, been in the storm for so long. There are some people I can call, but I got to give them a break because I can't keep on calling them. Y'all haven't been there before. You know they love you. You know they answer the phone, but you starting to feel like, man, I'm just weighing them down with my stuff and everybody got their own stuff. Kind of trouble. I'm talking about sitting in a chair, wondering how I got here. And even as a man, tears running down my face, what kind of trouble is this? And I've had to come to the sobering conclusion that even my trust in God, even my salvation did not exempt me from being in that kind of trouble. But I got good news. Trouble may knock on my door, but it doesn't run my house. Trouble may try to define your story, but it does not write your ending. I'm giving you good news already. Trouble may try to weigh you down, but you got a God that will lift you up. Why? Because when you know how to follow God, you may have trouble, but trouble don't have you. Can I build my case here? Can I, can I build my case here? Oh. We have, once again, for our sermonic moment, this psalm called Psalm 27. And in this Psalm 27, y'all, I, I, got, a, I, I got a new phone. I'm really enjoying this, really enjoying this new phone. And no, it is not an iPhone, all right? And so just, <laughs> just, just to be clear, I, God gave me wisdom and discernment. Okay, all right. I, look at <laughs> Look, look, at, look at what David says on his way to verse 5 and 6 in the 27th Psalm. David, of the 150 Psalms, wrote, see, y'all forgot already, 73 of the 150 Psalms. David wrote 73 of these 150 Psalms. And this is what David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up the flesh, they stumbled and failed. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired. One thing that I will seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. And now he says, for in the time of trouble, For in the time of trouble, this is what it says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. So when I have trouble, and the reality of life is I am going to have trouble. And this is what David says, in my time of trouble, I found a God that hid me and hid me in something he describes as a pavilions. First up, we got we to give, give a pause and analysis to these pavilions. Because my question was, what's a pavilion? The people of God, they had nomadic roots. When they were delivered out of the land of, of Egypt, they spent 40, 40 years traveling because they didn't have a home. They were trying to make their way to the promised land, so they were nomads. That means that they were here for a period of time, then they would pick up and move, go to another place, be there for a period of time, pick up the stuff and do what they needed to do, move to another place for a period of time, and they did it for 40 years. They were nomadic people, and these nomads had something called pavilions. And even though David is no longer a part of this nomadic tradition, they were nomads so long, certain things just became a part of the culture. Okay, y'all looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. 
You know how certain things, even though uh, you don't really know exactly why, it is just deeply rooted in the culture? Okay, all right, let me see. I knew y'all were going to look at me like that. Uh, if I broke out the room, y'all not going to sit right there and be like, well, I wonder what is happening. Do you want to inquire why the pastor just read? It is cultural. If I break out running, this place going to clear. And we'll find out why later. <laughs> it's cultural, y'all. Just like that one old bacon pan you have. You've had it forever. It, it's not even the original color it used to be. Everybody have at least one of them. I don't know why. It's just, it's just culture. Just like when you, when you lost and you drive them. And when you get lost, you know what you do. You turn the music down. You're like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta figure this thing out here. Yeah. Nobody taught you. Nobody said, this is what you gotta do. It's just culture. Can I, can I give you one, one last one? Can I give you one last one? It's like, it's like when, it's like when you're trying to think of something, but you can't think of it, but it's like right there on the tip of your tongue, so you start to do this, like, it's like, uh, um, it's like, uh, uh, like, what, what, what is this? What, what is, what is this? What is, what, what? It's helping me, right? It's helping me get, it is part of the culture. So when David says, God hid me in a pavilion, even though he is no longer in nomadic culture, what he is speaking to is something that has become ingrained in the culture. So what was a pavilion? When they were nomads, they would set up structures for covering from the elements, and these structures would be called pavilions. These pavilions would be made out of the materials that they had in the area. It would be sticks and trees and branches and leaves and straw and grass and whatever they had there. They would take it and they would build a pavilion. And the pavilion would shelter them from the storm, from the sun, from the wind, from the rain. It was only a temporary structure because they needed to build it wherever they were. It was a pavilion was a temporary structure that gave them cover. Y'all just missed the whole blessing. David said, God is my pavilion. He said, God is my covering, but you still missing that. Remember, it was a temporary structure. Why was it a temporary structure? It was a temporary structure because when they left and moved to the next place, if they had to leave the pavilion, when they left, they left their covering. Y'all not walking with me here. But because the pavilion is mobile, that means that everywhere they went, their covering went. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, you, you don't have to take my, my word for it. Uh, remember, this is David who's writing this psalm right here. David was in trouble, surrounded by enemies in the wilderness of en -Jedi. And in en -Jedi, God showed up and covered him. David was in trouble when he fought despair in the Valley of Elah. And in the Valley of Elah, God showed up and covered him. David was in trouble in a place called Nob. Uh, the King Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him. And in Nob, God showed up and covered him. David was in trouble in a place called the city of Goth. He was surrounded by enemies. And God showed up in the city of Goth and covered him. David was being hunted in a place called the forest of Herath. And in the forest of Herath, God showed up there and covered him. What David is trying to tell you and what I am trying to tell you is with God is your pavilion. I, Holy Ghost help me preach in here. When I can't get to the sanctuary, I know there's somebody in here right now, you thank God that he meets you in the sanctuary. You thank God that he meets you in this space. You thank God that he meets you at the altar. You thank God that he meets you in the pew. But the fact of the matter is, this is not the only place you need God to meet you. 
if we being honest about our trouble, we don't need God to just meet us in the sanctuary. Some of us are praying, God, I need you to meet me at my bedside. Because late at night, when the phone isn't ringing and the text messages have stopped, the devil does a good job playing with our mind. And some of us, he has, he has us running so many fear scenarios. What if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this doesn't go well? And what if that doesn't go right? And we lose in sleep and we lose in peace. And where we need God to meet us is right there. And cover me, Lord. Some of us need God to meet us in our living rooms. You haven't spoken to your spouse, you haven't spoken to your significant other in days, and you have, you're not ready to give up on it. You believe and you're trusting in God for healing and reconciliation, and you're saying, God, I trust that you will meet me in the sanctuary, but I'm also trust that you'll meet me right here in my own home. Cover our relationship, God. All right. Y'all didn't like that one. Some of y'all, some of y'all got a prayer. Cut a repo man looking for your car right now. And you like, and you like, Lord, if you just cover, you just cover my car. When the repo man come by, just don't even let him see it, Lord. Just let him. Y'all, y'all never had a car repossessed. Okay, that's, that's just me. That's just me then. That's just. God will meet you at your trouble, in your trouble, at the store, at your job, in your heartbreak, in your loss. He's covering your daughters right now. He's covering your sons right now. He's covering your mom right now. He's covering your dad right now. He's covering your friends right now. And while on others thou art calling, he's covering me right now too. So somebody should thank God for his covering that meets you at your point of need. That even when you can't make it to him, God has the power to bring a pavilion to you. Did I, did I, did I mention the fact that when the people of God would leave one place to go to the next place, they did not pack up the pavilion they left the pavilion where it was. And when they got to the new place, they built a pavilion there. They didn't drag old stuff to a new place. You know, by the time you get to a certain age, I feel like it's almost impossible to have a certain degree of baggage. And some of us, and some of us, it is not the issue that you have baggage. It's the issue that you're not real about the baggage you have. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me preach in here. Because if I'm not real about the baggage I have, how can I really deal with the baggage that I have? And because I am not properly dealing with it, I keep dragging old stuff to a new situation. But they would leave the old because they knew every time they got to a new place, God was going to give them what they needed in the new place. That's why of the many descriptive terms they gave God, they included this one. It is called Jehovah Jireh. For those of you that don't know what Jehovah Jireh is, it means God will provide. So every time they got to a new place, they found new covering. And every time they turned around, God just kept on making a way. And I came to give you good news in the midst of your trouble that when you get where God has you, or even where you are right now, God has a blessing for you already. Because every time I turn around, I was just looking to see what, what my witness was. Every time I turn around. Oh. No, y'all. Because every time I turn around, he keeps on. Okay. All right. All right. 
I got, got to keep this gospel train moving. So there, is, there are pavilions and then there are progressions. There are pavilions. David said he hides me in his pavilion. And then there is progression. The next thing that we see happen in the text, it says that you shall set me up upon a rock. Up upon. You shall set me up upon. Do you hear the language? I am climbing. I am getting higher. I am up upon a rock. I want y'all to take note of this. David is brilliant in his praise and prayer. He doesn't just say, I'm on a rock, y'all, and my enemy's down there. Because if he does, we began to think, oh, well, this is about him being lifted up above his enemies. Yeah, forget the haters. Yeah, forget the doubters. They, 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 we make it about them. But before he tells you he's on a rock, he tells you how he got there. He talks about the trouble first. Take note. He just doesn't say I'm on a rock. See, and let me say, God don't lift you up so you can look down on other people. Y'all know them people that define themselves by their titles? Man, I am. I am this title. I am that title. I'm like, no, nobody cares, bro. No, no, nobody cares. Uh, uh, I go into, a, sometimes I go into a room and they, I'm Reverend this, I'm Dr. That. I don't know who are you? I'm like, I'm Chris. That's, that's, that, that's who I am. That's, that's, that's my name. They say you just set me up upon a, upon a rock. Now you take note of the order. He talks about the trouble he went through before he talks about the rock he stands on. Because David did not panic. Because David trusted that God would be his pavilion and his covering, it leads him to being on a rock. David proclaims this then. My situation, trouble. Somebody say trouble. My situation provided the vehicle for my elevation. Walk with me here. Eh? I'm not just telling you I'm on a rock. I'm telling you how I got here. And the way I got here is I was in trouble. God hit me. And the next thing you saw, I was up on a rock. Because if you don't understand my journey, you'll think this is about me being lifted higher than my enemies, but it's not. It's about how I trusted in God. Yeah. This Psalm 5 and 6, verse 5 and 6, is about praise and progress. But the process of my progress is not going to always be pretty. The process of my progress is not going to always be pretty. And if you care about being on the rock, you got to know how I got there. If you care about being on firm foundation, you got to understand how I got there. The real blessing is not in knowing I'm on the rock. The real blessing is how you get up there. Yeah, okay, y'all. I need my sons to know. I need my sons to know that it was a journey and continues to be a journey. I need my daughters to know that daddy ain't perfect. This has been a journey, and I, and I still mess up, and I still have my flaws, and I still got things I need God to clean up in, in my life. But through the trouble, I keep trusting I need my church to know. I said, I really don't know what y'all see when y'all look at, at me. I know who I am. I'm a, I'm a boy born in Salisbury, North Carolina, grew up in Charlotte. Uh, I have, I went to A&T. That, that's all a lot of bio stuff. But when I look at myself, I know the things that I had to go through in order to get here. And if I stand in front of you acting like I never messed up, acting like I have no flaws, then you will think that is what a real journey is. That ain't the reality of it. I am more than suits and clergy robes and ties and, and degrees, but I am more, but I'm also more than the trouble I've been in, more than the mistakes I've made, more than the setbacks that I have. And the way you get up on a rock, 
The way you get up on the rock is understanding that many times the process of your progress will not look pretty and it will not be easy. But if you keep your trust in the Lord, now y'all ain't feeling me over here. I need you to understand that the process of progress will probably not be pretty and it definitely will not be easy. But if you keep your trust in the Lord, God, help me to trust that even, if, that even my trouble can bring about triumph. You're waiting on God to make your process pretty. And I'm praying that whatever the circumstance is, I learn how to trust in God's process. Because Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For surely I know the plans God has for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, plans to not harm you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future and with hope. So give me the, so it might not be pretty, but tell me the process, how you got up on the rock. Oh, uh, okay, you want to be a homeowner? Give me the process. And I know the process ain't just praying. It's got to be some budgeting in there. It's got to be some living within my means. It's got to be, I got to call some of the people, some of the businesses that I owe and say, hey, listen, I can't give it all to you. Can we work out a payment plan? What, you need my real number? Can I call you? Yeah, can I, can I call? <laughs> the process to your progress may not be pretty, but you got to know how to go through trouble to get set up on a high rock. What is the process of changing some generational curses? Some of the things that have been prevalent in your family generation after generation. That means sometimes you're going to have to set some boundaries with people even in your own family. And I'm talking about being respectful. Do not disrespect your elders. Even if they, even if they disrespect you, do not disrespect your elders. You can't get something good acting, acting a fool. But you set some healthy boundaries. You set some healthy standards for yourself, for your kids, for your sons, for your daughters, because the process of your progress may not be pretty, but if you trust God through it, I want y'all to prayerfully consider praying to God for a mentor. We have mentors for kids, but we act like once we hit 18, we don't need mentors anymore. We need, we still need mentors. Men, I, I thank God that he's put me around some good brothers that can help mentor me, show me some things. Uh, when uh, uh, parents, parents need mentors to be parents. You need mentors at your job. You need mentors in your life. You need mentors that can help show you some stuff, learn from their mistakes. That like, see, when you get to be an adult, for some reason, somebody told you when you turn 18 or 21, you got to start acting like you know everything. And a lot of the mistakes we make, we could have learned if we had somebody we trusted to help navigate through it. Yeah, you at your grown age, get a mentor. Yeah, I'm talking to you, you at 60, go get a mentor that's 80. Yeah, I'm talking to y'all too. I know he's like, he talking to the young folk. No, I'm talking to you too. You don't know everything just because you're 65. I digress. I got to close here. I got, I got to close. In a time of trouble, he shall hide me. He shall hide me in the secret of his pavilion. He shall hide me in his tabernacle. And now I'm lifted up upon a rock. And verse 6 says, verse 6 says, uh, and now my head shall be lifted up. Okay, so there are pavilions, there are progressions, and then there are positions. Positions, positions. Um, look at the chronological order of how David has set this thing up. 
He had said, I was in trouble. God hid me in his pavilion. He covered me. Then he gave me progress because through the trouble, I actually ended up higher than I was when the trouble started. Now I'm on a rock. Now this is the position chronologically. It says that he's on a rock. David says, and my head is lifted up. David, it also says that David's enemies are surrounding the rock he's standing on. It's right there in the text. David's enemies are there. And David declares, I will sing, yet I will sing praises unto the Lord. Uh, some of y'all missed that. And I want to make sure you, you know, uh, uh, David said, God hid me from trouble. David said, God placed me on a rock from trouble. But David never said, trouble stopped looking for me. Did he say anything about that, Mom? David, David said, God hid me from trouble. God covered me from trouble. God set me on a rock from trouble. But he never said trouble stopped looking for me. And it becomes evident because it said that his enemies are still right there. Uh, it is something, you try to mind your own business, do your own thing, and people won't leave you alone. The enemies are still there. They're, they're still watching. Y'all know it's called hate watching. That's what some people did to Skip Bayless. They couldn't stand them, but they tuned in just to watch. Even though they didn't like, y'all don't know Skip Bayless. Okay, y'all, some of y'all, okay, all right. Well, maybe you know this one. That's what some of y'all do with that dude named Marcel or Marcellus or whatever he, the, from, from that reality show. Uh, uh, I don't, wh wh which one is it? Huh? The, the love in Huntsville, yeah, they tune in, just, tune in just to hate them. Can't stand them, but can't stop watching. I know y'all act like y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, you, know that's what, you know that's what politics are based on, hate watching. To make you hate Donald Trump. To make you hate uh, Joe Biden. Make you hate Kamala Harris. So all these commercials, ooh, look at how terrible they are. Ooh, look at how terrible this one is. Don't you hate them by now? Don't you hate this person? That, it, we live in a culture that is just uh, overwhelmed with hate watching. Some of y'all deal with it when you go to work. They don't like you, but can't stop watching. Watch the way you come in. Watch when you sit at your desk. Watch when you leave to see how long you're going to be gone for your lunch break. You had an hour, you were gone for an hour and two minutes. They like. <laughs> they check your socials. They on your socials. Checking to see what you're doing, who you're with, where you're going. You don't like me. Why are you watching me? You know they know your last vacation, right? <laughs> hey, why, why? How they get to be? How they get to go over there? Uh, because the Lord has been good. He has blessed me in abundance. And if, but I want you to take note. It says, David says, I went through trouble. Going through the trouble, I trusted in God because He covered me. He then set me up on a rock. My enemies were there watching me. What does David say he watching? You already closed it. You don't even know. He says, while they're watching me, my head is lifted up. Okay. Y'all like, I still don't know what it means for his head to be lifted up. David gave further context and clarity to this when he said, I will lift. I thought I had some Bible readers in here. Mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. In case you didn't know, all of my help cometh from the Lord. So David said, I got trouble, but trouble does not have me 
And is there anybody in here? Is there anybody in here that can say I've gone through the fire? I've been through the flood. I've been broken in the pieces. See lightning flashing from above. But through it all, I remember that he loves me and he cares. And I got a testimony today that the God I serve, the God I serve has been mighty, 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 mighty good to me because the Lord will be a bridge over troubled waters, over troubled waters, over troubled waters. Everybody stand to your feet. Over troubled waters, over troubled waters. It be a bridge over troubled waters. Cause I got trouble, but trouble don't have me. Door of the church is open. Door of God's church is open. If you are in this space, or if you're even connected with us, not in this space, and your soul is saved, y'all not wait all week long just to get back to this moment right here. Because there could be somebody in here that I thank God that you on a Sunday got dressed, got ready, got prepared, came to God's house. But if, but you know, you know deep down that you have not given your life to, to the Lord. I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, yeah, yeah, you, you know you ain't doing everything. No, I'm saying you know your soul is not saved. That you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior. To say, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you with everything I am. I trust you with everything I will ever be. I trust you, God, with everything I'm not. And I want to give my life to you. I want you to save my soul. God, I want you to save my soul. You love me. And God, I'm ready to say, I love you back. Save my soul, Lord. Give my life. Come on, come on and give God a hand and pray. Give. God, God, order my steps. God, make my path in front of me. Lord, save my soul. And you are saying that, yeah, this is the day I become perfect. No, you're saying this is the day I, I start to follow a, a, per, a perfect and loving Savior. And if your soul is not saved, brother, you ought to come. Sister, you ought to come and let this be the day of your salvation. Will you come? Will you come from wherever you are? I know the devil is trying to do everything he can to keep you right where you are. He's telling you every lie. He's giving you every excuse. He's giving you everything he probably can to make you stay right where you are. Will you tell him, no, I hear God knocking on my heart. I got to go. I got to go. Come on, come on, come on. You ought to come today. Come on, come on. You ought to, you ought to come today. Come on, you ought to come today. Come on. If, if you are, if you're in the balcony, you might be saying, that's a long walk. It ain't that long. It ain't that long. It ain't that long. And don't, don't let the fact that you're going to be coming in front of other people change. We just people. We just, we just, we just people. We, we watch the Olympics. Y'all, y'all see the Olympics, man, those. Yeah, well they, they get down in the block, and I'm like, well, yeah. I get, I get nervous like I'm about to run. I'll be like, oh, come on. We're just people, and God is calling your name. And if you hear God call your name, sister, you ought to come on down. Brother, you ought to come on down and be saved. And if you're already saved, we thank God for saving your soul. But if you are here without a church home, and Lewis Chapel is the place where God is calling you to come, we welcome you with all the warmth and love of Jesus Christ. You ought to come. Come on, come on, give God a hand of praise. Come on, you ought to come today. We, come on, come on, give God a hand of praise. We're going to see why you make your heart up. We're going to see why you make your heart up. Hold on, my brother. Hold on, my brother. Don't give up. Hold on, my sister. Just look up. There is a mass that is all for you. If you just make it through, God's going to really blow your mind. He's going to make it worth your time for all of the trouble.
needs your help. Do you know that you could be standing in the very vicinity of somebody that is on the verge of changing their life for the better forever? You could. You, they could be right on your left, your right, in front of you or behind you. And I know it might be a little uncomfortable, but I'm asking you to help me to help them to change their life for the better. Could you just find somebody in your area? Just find somebody. And just ask them, do we need to go down? Come on, come, come on, come on to help me. Come on to help me to help them. Do we, come on, help, help me to help them. Do, do, do we need to go? 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 I don't want you to miss what God is calling you into. Do we need to go? Do we need to go? Joining by way of Christian experience. Well, 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 and okay, down here, got it. That's the Stackhouse Lewis Chapel. We have Josiah Cox coming for baptism. We also have Jadine Cox coming for baptism. And Janae Pope coming for Christian experience. Hey, Lewis Chapel, let's greet you by saying hey. hey. We welcome you with all the warmth and love of Jesus Christ. We're gonna we're gonna close out in prayer. Before we do, let me let me just remind you or inform you the door of God's church is like the door of the Waffle House. Wait, I didn't miss anybody, did I? I, I? I got everybody. I thought so. Yeah, yeah, I got I got everybody. Thank you. Thank you for making sure, though. Yeah, do it. So all you got to do is go to lewischapel.org. When, when you get lewischapel.org, uh, there's a place at the top of the screen that says join. When you get there, just click that. Give us your name, email, and phone number, and I cannot wait to reach out to you. Um, let us pray. Let us pray. One, our intake counselors will be right over by this music pit. You'll know them by their by their red sash. So if you still want to join the church and give your life to Christ, you can just meet them right over there. I'll be standing outside. Uh, if you need to give your life to Christ or join the church, you can just let me know right out there. Uh, people ask me, do people do that in the parking lot? It happens all the time. So I just want you to know that your opportunity, your chance has not passed you by. But don't wait too long, because tomorrow is not promised. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, God, I thank you for showing up in such a significant way, Lord. I pray that the word that has been preached has reached exactly who you needed it to reach, God. And that it has done exactly what you required of me to do. God, there is a multitude of things that we can pray for today. God, for, for the brother that I was told was in the midst of a heart attack, Holy Ghost, have your way. And God, not only for him, but for the multitude of people that are standing in the need of prayer. I remember my father praying and thanking you, God, that you are a God who's able. Able, God, to do everything that we stand in need of. So, God, I thank you for being a God who's able. And now, unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before his Father with exceedingly great joy. To the one who is ruler, he who is maker of both heaven and earth, be both power, glory, honor, and dominion. To God, our creator, Jesus, our savior, and to the Holy Spirit, our comforter, may this trinity rest ruling by henceforth, now, forever and ever and evermore. And the church said,
Amen. God bless you. God bless you.